And we should be live. Excellent. So, let's just make sure this is working. It's going to be difficult for me to check the stream as well as uh, do this, but let's see if this is working. I tell you, it would be really, really useful if people can see this. If you can use the ask a question functionality, you'll need to click on the Q&A button. At, if you can see me talking now, there should be a little Q&A button. If you click on that, you can ask me a question, and I should see a question coming up. So I'm actually asking you a question to ask me a question, which is a bit bizarre, but we're just setting things up um, and making thing, make sure that things are working for the next 45 minutes to an hour. So if you can hear me, if you can see me okay, then I'd appreciate if you use the um, ask a question, the Q&A button, click on that, and then you'll be able to ask me a question. Of course, you can use this opportunity just to ask me a question. Excellent, I've got one already. Here we go. Mike Down saying, hi, Doug. Yes, we can see you and hear you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Mike. So, let's get started. My name is Doug Belshaw. I'm going to be your host for the next 45 minutes to an hour. It's a bit odd. I do use Google Plus relatively often, but it's usually somebody else who sets um, these webinars and live sessions up. Um, and I'm usually one amongst a, a panel of people. So um, this is a bit odd, me doing things by myself. But it is because I'm really excited to have launched um, a book which I've been working on for the last two years, ever since I finished my doctoral thesis. In fact, Friday was um, the two-year anniversary of me going around Durham Cathedral and collecting my um, doctorate from Durham. So the reason I, I wrote this book um, is because I wanted, it to make, I wanted to make the work that I'd done relevant to educators. And I hope that um, even if you don't stay for the entire session, you're very welcome to, to bob in and out. I know the football's going to be on later. Um, I want to make it as relevant as possible to educators to try and make sure that they can take the theory, some of the theories in the book, and put it into practice. Um, my, my background is I used to be a teacher, I used to be a senior leader, I worked in higher education, and um, I really do think it's important to take those ideas that are somewhat theoretical and, and put them into practice. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to share my screen, um, and I'm going to share my screen to show you something which is on SlideShare. So um, here we go. I'm going to get infinite regression to start off with. And I'm going to go and share my screen, and I'm going to go to my SlideShare profile, slideshare.net forward slash DAJ Belshaw. Um, and when you go there, you can follow along either uh, by watching my screen, or you can um, go there yourself, just the link, slideshare.net forward slash DAJ Belshaw. You'll see this presentation here. I'm just going to make that full screen so you can see it. Um, and this is what we're going to be going through um, on and off throughout this session. You'll, you'll see me back on the screen in a moment, but for the moment, we're just going to have a quick click through this. So, so this is the name of my book, The Essential Elements of Digital Literacies. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, rather than me whittling on for a bit, I'm going to ask you to do something. In fact, I'm just going to tweet out um, something now. If you follow me on Twitter, I'm at DAJ Belshaw. And the hashtag we're going to use for this session is DigiLit. Now, this is not a unique hashtag, and that's on purpose. The, the hashtag we're using here is an established hashtag for digital literacy, or the digital literacies, as we'll find later on. Um, and it's one which is used by people worldwide. So it's worth hanging on to as a hashtag, not just for this session, um, but something which, if you use something like um, Hootsuite or, or TweetDeck, it's worth having that as the column just to pay attention to. So if you're tweeting from this session, you might want to append that hashtag to your tweet. Um, and that will work on Google+, Plus, on, on Twitter, um, and you can also get in touch with me by email. Let me just put those links on the screen for you. Um, I've recently changed my email address. Um, it's mail at dougbelshaw.com. So please do update, update your address books if you've emailed me previously. I'm at DAJ Belshaw on Twitter, which is the place I usually am. Um, and also plus Doug Belshaw on Google+, Plus, which is what we're using today for this particular hangout. So mail at dougbelshaw.com, at DAJ Belshaw, and plus Doug Belshaw. Hopefully that's um, relatively clear. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is take a picture of yourself 
in a situation um, around your computer, which is you don't usually take a picture of yourself. So I'm going to call this a context selfie. And, and the importance of context will become clear later. Uh, but I want to get you to do something, first of all. And I love, love, love this cartoon. This cartoon um, is something which someone put in a presentation. I can't remember who it was. Someone put in a presentation a while ago. Um, and this is so true of me. <laughs> This is so true. You clear out the space that people are going to see on the webcam, and nothing more. You do the. It's like the minimum viable product of of cleaning. Um, and so I, I love this. So I've just taken a picture of myself, um, and I've I've tweeted it out. And this is a picture of me in my home office, which is a very bizarre shape. Um, and you can see what I'm doing from a different angle to usual. So I'd love to see what you're doing, um, not just your usual webcam angle, but if you can use your phone or a tablet or something like that to take a picture of yourself from a different angle just to, to get the ball rolling so you're not just sitting there as a passive observer. Um, and if you use the hashtag context selfie, um, I'll see some of them um, coming in on my, on my Twitter stream and on Google Plus as well. So um, I wonder who's going to be the first one to do that. The other thing to say is, like I said before, you can ask questions at any time. I'm going to have like a dedicated question answer section at the end. Um, but if you've got any questions as we're going through, you can click um, in the window where you can see um, this screen at the moment. There should be a little Q&A button. And if you click on that, you should be able to answer, ask questions. And I, I might either answer them at the time, or if I feel like I'm going to answer them later on, I might just... Um, I just um, leave them to one side and, and deal with them at the appropriate time. So feel free to do that. I'm still waiting for a context selfie to come through. I really do just take some time to take the picture and then stick it on the social network. But that's, that's the first thing I'd like you to do, because this is a participative kind of live session. OK. So then without further ado, I know some people are here to get 20% off um, the book, which I've put on, on offer for seven ninety nine. Um, so if that's you, and you now want to go back and watch the football or do the dishes or play with the kids, feel free to um, use the offer code 20OFF. Um, so that's O-F-F, lowercase, 20 off, um, and that's at the link, which is at the bottom of your screen, gum.co forward slash digilit. That will take you directly to the ebook. And if you use um, 20 off when you're checking out, you will get 20% off the book. Um, I did create a website for the book, um, which is a digital literacies. There's a dot before the ES. But if you go directly to that link at the bottom, it takes you to Gumroad, which is the um, e-commerce solution that I'm using for this particular book. So let's see if any context selfies are coming through. Thank you very much, Tony Shepard, who's the first one. I can see him sitting there on his sofa. Um, with his iPad in front of him, with his green T-shirt on and his headphones, listening to me. Excellent. Thanks, Tony. I'm looking forward to some more coming through um, as we go along. All right, then. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do, um, over and above that context selfie, before um, I impart some words of semi-wisdom, are how many definitions of digital literacy can you find in the next five minutes? Now, I've used the word find and not search for um, advisedly there because I want you to think about the different ways in which you could find um, definitions of digital literacy. And I have a purpose for this, and I will kind of feed them back. If you want to tweet those out, if you want to tweet out some definitions of digital literacy, um, do use the hashtag digilit, either on Google Plus or on Twitter. Um, and if the definition is, is too long for a tweet, as I suggest some of them might be, then what you might want to do, you might want to link to the particular place where there's a definition of digital literacy, but in your tweet mention the fact that um, there's a definition in there. OK, Verena, thank you very much for um, putting a picture of you, context selfie, while you're um, supervising the kids playing soccer. That's awesome. Thank you very much. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say over the next five minutes, what you need to be doing is to get yourself a context selfie there on Twitter or Google Plus, um, and also find some definitions of, of digital literacies. Okay, I'm going to head back into the into the Google Plus thing to see if there's any questions yet. Jerome said, "See you, hi Doug. Excellent, thank you very much. Good, and I can see that it's working because I can see myself on another laptop screen. It's a good job I've got several laptops, eh? Okay." Right, I'm going to leave that for two seconds, and I'm going to go back to here, and I'm going to turn off screen sharing. 
wish there was an easier way to do that. There we go. Good. Okay. So um, I think context is really important. And just while you're coming up with some definitions of digital literacy there, um, I'm just going to preempt uh, the, the solution that you, you find yourself in a moment by saying that there was a book in 1997, which is the first book that I came across about digital literacies. And it was a by, by, by a guy called Paul Gilster. Now, this guy was a, a journalist. You know, he wasn't an academic. He didn't specialize in, in digital literacy or anything like that. But he decided to write a book on digital literacy. Because in 1997, if you can remember back that far, what the web was like, digital literacy was like, all of this stuff that was happening, um, he realized that there was something, some kind of new skill, something new that was happening that people needed to know about. And so he wrote this um, this quite enjoyable book, if you ever get a chance to read it. Um, it's just called Digital Literacy by Paul Gilster. Um, it's in most libraries. Um, you'll find in this book that he makes over 33 different definitions of digital literacy. And some of them are really useful. So he talks about, for example, um, just off the top of my head, he talks about um, capturing ideas and not keystrokes. It's not about like the procedural elements. It's about something a bit more than that. But throughout the book, he makes all of these very different definitions of digital literacy. Um, and the thing that I was trying to research at the time was like, well, what does it mean to be educated in the 21st century? And I found this fascinating, the fact that people couldn't settle on one definition of digital literacy. So uh, I'd be interested to see what kind of different definitions come through and see if anyone's tweeting that out yet. I'm going to have a look on the, on the Google Plus stream. But um, I just found it absolutely fascinating that, that something as simple you'd think as digital literacy, people couldn't get their heads around it and people couldn't come up with one definition. So I investigated a bit further and that's how I ended up doing my, my research and, and ended up with my thesis while I was teaching at the same time. Okay, so I'm just going to see if there's any more definitions coming through now. If you've got a definition of digital literacy, just append the hashtag digilit to it and then we'll um, move swiftly on. Share my screen again. A reminder that it's um, slideshare.net forward slash DAJ Belshaw if you want these slides. All right, then. Now, I might be moving quite quickly. In fact, I know I'm moving quite quickly. I do tend to speak quite quickly because I, I live in the northeast of England. That's where I'm from. But in terms of digital literacy, I think what you'll find, even with a five minute search, you'll find lots and lots of different definitions of digital literacy. And as with anything, there's, there's two ways in which a definition or, or something can gain traction. Either it comes from an authority. So um, I used to work for an organization called JISC, and they've got a definition of digital, digital literacy, which comes through um, a consultant called Helen Beetham, very widely respected. I've worked with Helen. She's fantastic. Um, and it comes through the fact that it's a very good definition, but also the fact that JISC has authority in that particular sector. So if you say this is JISC's definition of digital literacy, people will tend to sit up and take notice of that. So if, for example, I don't know, in the tech space, Apple do something, people pay attention to that because it comes from people who have got a track record in that sector and people know that people are going to listen to that. Um, and then the other way things happen is if it's just obviously a good definition or if it's just a good piece of work, people tend to people tend to do that. But what you'll find with digital literacy is that there's so, so many different definitions that it's it's really quite confusing because they seem to be at odds with one another. Um, and you also get the fact that people tend to throw out the word digital literacy or the phrase digital literacy and say, that's a useless term, let's use this one instead. And my favorite example of that is um, a Norwegian researcher called Ola Erstad who decided to coin the term electricity um, in about 2004 which is it just an awful term. It really is bad. I mean, his work is wonderful, and he's, he's a really um, solid and, and really nice, um, writes really nice articles. But that particular definition, I, I thought, was actually really quite bad. Um, good to know as I've done some bad things in my time, but that, that definition really did jump the shark quite quickly. Okay, then. So I think what you'll find quite quickly, if you look at definitions of digital literacies, is basically digital literacy is whatever you want to, to say. Um, and there's a lot of people using a lot of words to come up with what digital literacy is. Um, and so I, I would say so much ink has been spilled, but that would be an inappropriate metaphor. But you know what I mean. There's been so, much, so, so much um, effort spent on trying to define a single digital literacy um, that I found it so problematic. And I, I really did get stuck. And at one point, I was going to just abandon my thesis and give up because I thought that this is just an intractable problem and you just can't get around it. There's no definition of digital literacy. People are trying to come up with one definition to rule them all. It's almost like, you know, um, 
Lord of the Rings, trying to have one one ring to rule them all in the darkness, buying them one definition, and as long as we come up with one definition of digital literacy, then everything will be fine, will be will be will be happy, and will be solved. And what I realised quite quickly is that the problem is that the term literacy is itself problematic. In fact, in the 1950s, UNESCO said that you couldn't really decide whether someone was um, literate or illiterate. It's not like a, a binary state. The shades of grey in between. And that was back in the 1950s when people are talking about traditional print literacy. Um, and what I realized that when you add a modifier like digital to, to something which is already kind of problematic like literacy, then you end up with quite an ambiguous term. Um, because you've got literacy, which isn't very well defined. Um, and you've also got digital, which seems to apply to almost anything. I mean, like a, a digital watch that I had when I was younger, um, a digital computer, phones are digital. Almost everything is digital these days. And really, some things have quite a lot in common, but some things have almost nothing in common. So what kind of literacy or skills does it take just because something's digital? So I realized quite quickly that we're not talking about digital literacy as a singular thing, but we're talking about digital literacies in, in the plural. Um, I see Robin's just put a context selfie with her dog. Is that a greyhound? Wonderful. Thank you for that. Oh, and you're outside as well. Lovely. Um, so yeah, digital literacies. So I, it's a plural thing. It depends on context. Um, and it's really important to think about things in their plurality. Because if we're, if we're fixated on a single digital literacy, then we're going to end up pursuing the wrong problem. And we're not going to end up doing any useful work. And at the end of the day, it's not about endlessly trying to come up with definitions. It's about trying to put those things into practice. All right, and there we go. So digital literacies, I would suggest, are highly, highly context dependent, which is one of the reasons I try to get you to do that context selfie. And if you haven't done that yet, it will be a wonderful thing to do and, and to pop up my screen as we're going along. So digital literacies, no matter what context you're in, are going to look slightly different. So if you're working in, I don't know, um, higher education, digital literacies are going to look different whether you're a staff, a member of staff, or a student. Um, they're going to be different depending on whether your institution is like a, a solely online institution or whether it's solely offline or blended or whatever. It's going to depend differently with my kids, for example, to uh, my grandmother. It's going to be different depending on whether you're talking about work-based learning. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be very different depending on the context in which you find yourself. So it's really, it's, I, I think it's really important not to have a, a very narrow prescriptive single definition of a single dig digital literacy, but to recognize the plurality in the world and to realize that really when we're talking about this thing called digital literacies, yes, we need to map the territory, we need to find out what's going on, but we need to recognize the fact that digital literacies can look different in different contexts. Okay, so shall we just give up? I mean, it, it, it's defining digital literacies. Is is trying to come up with some guidance for digital literacies too hard? Should we just give up and say, well, really, this is going to be too much of a hard job for 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 this? You know, there's no academic basis. There's no point in trying to do practice. Let's just let thousand flowers bloom. Just whatever happens, happens. And hey, aren't these kids digital natives anyway? Can't we just give in? Why do we even need to talk about digital literacy? Why don't we just you know just get on with it and stop you know? academic posturing and, and you know, that kind of thing. George, I love that photograph. I think that might be Photoshop slightly because George is um, half transparent in his uh, context selfie um, and also has the Earth in the background. I don't think you're on Mars, but um, nice try. Right. I'm going to get you to do something else because I don't want it just to just be, be me talking. I want you to go to a website called knowyourmeme.com. Now, this is one of my favorite websites on the internet. And if you've never been to this website, then this live session is worth it just for this website. So knowyourmeme.com. Go there right now, um, and you'll find the latest memes that are happening. Now, some of these really take off, and some of them last you know, a very short amount of time. In fact, in the book, um, I give an example of um, the Harlem Shake and of Success Kid as well, and I show it on Google Trends how these things spike and then fall away. And some of them spike really quickly, and some of them spike, um, or some of them are kind of slow burners. So you've got to know your meme.com. What you'll find um, are, are memes which are up and coming. But what they also do, which I find fascinating, and which really helps me as a researcher, is they research the memes. And, and they find out where they came from. 
and, and, and they find out where they originated, and they find out like how they evolved over time. Because memes, just like um, um, just like genes, kind of change and, and morph over time in an almost like quasi-biological um, sense. So I want you to go to knowyourmeme.com. Um, but what I want you to do at this point is um, I, I say in the book that if you if you can remix um, and make your own meme, then that contains so many different parts of, of digital literacies that, um, and we're going to get onto kind of the eight elements of digital literacies that I define in the book. But um, just before we do that, I say in the book that th being able to deal with memes encapsulates almost every element of digital literacies. So what I want you to do is, once you've gone to knowyourmeme.com and you've, you've had a little explore and you've found out something which you think might be worthwhile, I want you to go to, um, I think it's its sister website actually, which is um, memegenerator.net. Now, what I've done here is I've clicked, if you see on, I've, I've gone from home and this little tab here called characters, I've clicked on the god tier. Um, now, what this does here is it, it separates out memes into ones which work really well down to ones which don't work very well at all. And it, it's no surprise that in the god tier are some of my favorite memes. So Success Kid, um, I go through it at length in the book. But I think my favorite, absolute favorite meme, just because of the expression which makes me laugh every time, is the why you know guy. Um, and it's, again, it's something which I talk about in the book. So what I want you to do right now, if you could, while you're doing your context selfies um, and while you're coming up with the definitions of digital literacies that you found from various places, um, I want you to go to memegenerator.net and I want you to make your own meme or remix one. So here's mine, this is Success Kid. Run a G plus hangout and people came. I wasn't just by myself. And you'll see in the book where that particular photo comes from um, and why in 2007 just a mother taking a photograph of her son on a beach became a worldwide ph phenomenon and then ended up on a virgin media billboard. So remix a meme of your own choice. This is super easy to do. You go to memegenerator.net you click on the one that you want, you see some examples, you see, you get into the idea of the humor of it, like the, the context of it, you get into the, the way that they're structured. Um, you simply press remix this, um, and then you can create your own version of that meme. And I'd love it if you could post that on Google Plus or Twitter um, and stick the hashtag digilit in there, um, and I'll see those coming up on my, my Twitter and Google Plus streams. Excellent. I'm going to pause there. I'm going to see if there's any questions which are bubbling up in the in the chat yet. Thanks, Bobby, for for sharing the the links there. The hashtag for the for the selfie, um, Stefan, is context selfie, all one word. So hashtag context selfie. Mike saying, hear that term, digital natives? Yes, I was using it ironically because um, digital natives, which was a term which came was um, uh, introduced by Mark Prensky. Let me just turn my video back on while we're doing this. Go to meme generate on that to create your uh, meme. Mike, let's have a look. Just uh, turn off that. There we go. Excellent. Right. So my card is saying, um, I hate that term, digital native. So Mark Prensky, um, in 2001, two, something like that, wrote, a, wrote an article for a journal which was not peer reviewed. So this is not somebody writing an academic article where his peers have said, this is an awesome thing to publish. This is just somebody posting an opinion. And he said, basically, look at these people, these this next generation. They're like digital natives compared to the digital immigrants that, that we, this generation, are. And he made it sound like it was an, an age-based thing. He made it sound like it's to do with how old you are. It's to do with how much you kind of have this language or this um, accent um, about kind of digital spaces. Now. There's a wonderful, wonderful article in 2008 by Bennett, Maton, and Kirvin, I think it is, which absolutely demolishes Prensky's argument, um, to the extent that Prensky's since kind of withdrawn his um, ideas around um, uh, natives and immigrants. And Dave White, who's a researcher in Oxford, has worked with some other people to talk about visitors, digital visitors and digital residents, which is a much nicer metaphor when you're thinking about people who might be new to digital spaces. Not saying, not castigating from the fact that they're new to that space, um, and, and not saying this to do with their age, but to do with experience, got to do with their um, environment, got to do with their context. So I much, I much prefer David uh, White and his group of people's version of, of that particular metaphor. I'm just scrolling through the comments, see if there's anything else in there. 
I know that some people asked me some questions beforehand. I'm going to get to those at the end. Thank you, for, thank you for those. Some quite hard questions as well, which I very much appreciate. I don't like soft questions. Okay. Um, Jerome is saying, I don't see the pictures. Where do I have to look? Jerome, are you still having problems? Hi, Lee. Lee saying he's happy to be here. Just scrolling through these questions. I appreciate everyone coming along. Mike Downs. I appreciate Mike's Google Plus post. They're always um, insightful and relevant. For me, digital literacy is doing old school analog activities, but in a new way, i.e., watercolor, paint and brush and water, where come tablet and software. Mike, um, I've got a, I've got something I need to show you. Then, in fact, can I just show you this right now? This will be useful to Mike and to anyone else. Um, so I think it was Nick Dennis who showed me this first of all, and I've I've recast this, and this will be useful just to to show people. Um, I didn't want this just to be a book that. I, kind of published and then run away. I want it to be an ongoing conversation and something which will be built on for time. So there's a guy called Yokai Benkler who wrote a book called Wealth Networks. Um, and he, he used a wiki um, alongside that to grow the community around the book. Now, that might happen with this book. It might not. But I've, I've made it so that there's at least the opportunity to do that. So if you go to digital literacies with a dot before the ES, um, and then put a, a forward slash wiki in there. So digital literacy is forward slash wiki. You'll end up here, um, and it tells you some stuff about how to create an account and fill out your profile page. But basically, it's a wiki using the same software, MediaWiki, which uses which runs um, which runs Wikipedia. Now on the left hand side here, you can see I've got diagrams, um, and in diagram, these are all slightly higher res resolution versions of the diagrams I use in the book, and these are all available under a Creative Commons license. Um, so what I did was I recreated the uh, the diagram, which you can see all over the web, but in quite low resolution, called the Samir model by Ruben Pantajuro. Um, and I think it was Nick Dennis who showed me this first of all, because Apple use it quite a lot when they're doing um, their Apple Distinguished Educator stuff. Now what Mike's just described, and to be honest, you know, no problem with what he's what he's just always discussing there, but um, he's just he's describing what Ruben Pantajuro would call substitution. So tech acts as a direct tool substitute with no functional change. So really, you know, you're writing things on paper or you're drawing things on paper, and now you're drawing things on screen. So when I was working in schools as a teacher, it's the difference between um, using uh, a chalkboard and a blackboard um, and now using an interactive whiteboard, but not doing anything different, you know, just literally doing the same thing. And, and what's really nice about Point of Jura's model is that it uses this kind of taxonomy to try and scaffold um, educators' learning to use technology in a different way. So it goes through substitution to augmentation to have some kind of functional improvement. So, um, I don't know, the whiteboard example, it might be you can now um, record the teacher doing it as like a screencast. Um, and you can save that back, and then the kids can see that at home. I don't know. Um, but then above that line, above the augmentation line, this is the bit he calls transformation. This is when the technology allows through modification of the task for significant task redesign. There's literally like things you couldn't do before um, with technology, which you can now do. So um, you know, hashtags. Are, you, we don't. We forget how useful hashtags are for collating things around conferences, but they're also useful for, for collating things around classrooms and, you know, being able to continue things that you start in the classroom. You know, I can remember, this is a really obvious example, but, you know, using, like, getting kids to collaborate on a Google Docs presentation in the classroom and then continuing to, to do for homework, you know, that, that allows you to redesign the task based on the affordances of the technology. And finally, redefinition. This is the creation of new tasks which are previously inconceivable. So this would be, um, I don't know, like working in real time, like I do every day at my job in Mozilla, working in real time with people across continents um, to do things across time zones in real time to affect policies, do all this kind of stuff. This was previously inconceivable without the technology. You couldn't shout loud enough to do it for a start. So um, that point of Joe's sound model, if you haven't come across it before, it's alongside those diagrams, which are on the wiki, um, and that's at digital literacies forward slash wiki. OK, bit of an ad lib there. That's what it's all about. There we go. Can we have a link to that article you just mentioned? Thanks. So Mike's asking for the Bennett, Maiden, and Curvin one. Mike, um, can you just write that, can you put Bennett and Maiden, and I'll try and find it in a moment. If I try and do it live, I will spectacularly fail it, because I'm male and I can't multitask. 
If someone else can find Bennett, Maiden, and Curve in 2008, you can type into Google Scholar. It's a good, good place to start. It might be paywalled, but you might be able to find a PDF. Um, James has talked about the Samuel model. Thank you, James. Doug's digital literacy, relativism, relevant to context. Absolutely. I'm a relativist through and through. Ethnocentrism for the win. Doug, how tricky was it for you to translate ideas from theory to practice? So, Miles, that's a really interesting question. Let me just answer that one very quickly now. Um, so while I was while I was doing my uh, master's and my doctoral thesis, I was teaching, um, and I, I finished off my thesis when I wasn't in the classroom. But for the majority of it, I was, um, and it's fascinating. If you ever get a chance to to kind of do any kind of research whilst you're teaching, it it really does inform your practice. It can be really really um, frustrating at times because you see stuff in the literature which just doesn't seem to make sense in practice, and vice versa. Like. You know, this stuff that I'm seeing in the classroom doesn't seem to have any relevance in the literature. Um, and that's because the literature can be slower to, to adopt what's happening in the classroom. But once you, once you get into a, a stage where your research is influencing what you're doing in the classroom, it can be absolutely fascinating. So um, especially doing things like Punta Joe's model, thinking about um, the, the context dependence of literacies. So that can be between year groups, it can be between um, people from different socioeconomic statuses. Um, at one time, I was um, uh, I was like a e-learning staff tutor, um, so I was not only teaching kids, but I was teaching teachers how to use technology and looking at the different metaphors you had to use to um, to, to break down resistance or try to um, like find something to to hook you know an idea on or or something like that. So um, it's something which I can talk about at great length, Miles, but um, perhaps not on this on this particular call. I'd love to follow up with you if you if you're interested. James has, has shared his um, selfie meme thing. Thank you very much. I might have to click on that in a moment. I will share all those later on. Will I be publishing this Hangout? Yes, I will. I believe this is a Hangout on air, so this means that it's going to be um, recorded and published on YouTube. I might have to edit bits out in, in case I say something inappropriate. Jerome has already set his profile up on the wiki because he is awesome. Thank you very much, Jerome. Um, James is saying digital literacy, the ability to analyze a whole variety of things, terms, words, and sentences in the virtual world of no value, apparently, or so says Michael Gove. Michael Gove is an idiot. Will this hangout be available on YouTube? Yes. Hello, Doug Miles. Hello. I'm going back through time here. Ah, Jerome, thank you very much. I hope this shows up if I um, highlight this question. Might do, might not. Bennett, Maiden, 2010, Beyond the Digital Natives Debate Towards a More Nuanced Understanding of Students' Technology Experiences, Journal of Computer-Assisted Learning, 26.5, page 321-331. Awesome. Just clearing out all these questions. Feel free to answer me some more, and then I'll go back to the presentation. Do you want to hear me? Is there a Kindle version? Right, Bobby, this is, a, this is an important question. Is there a Kindle version? Is there an EPUB version? Let me say two things. Number one, there was going to be. And there was going to be an audiobook version of me in my dulcet tones reading my book. Um, with the audiobook, my wife said that would not be a good idea because I'd sound stupid. Um, with the Kindle and EPUB version, um, I fully intended to do that, um, but unfortunately my children were ill, my wife was marking exam papers, um, and I had to, to look after them. So that meant I was slightly behind track. But also, I think that I want to do that further down the line. Um, and the reason for that is because I'm going to reduce the price of this ebook over time until after two years it's going to be free. So about every six months, I'm going to reduce the price of the book um, so that by 2016, by the time 2016, the book will be free because, um, yeah, I, I just feel like it should be. It, it increased in price as we got up to this point, and I feel like if it decreased in price, um, it'll make my life easier. Um, and people who want it right now can buy it, and if they want it in one way, two years, they can do so there will be a Kindle version, and probably when it gets to be under five pounds, because no one buys things on a Kindle over five pounds today. Um, Lee said, "Amen." I don't really know what to. Um, for the independent schools inspectorate, I've shared using summer model to review how well schools are working in the space. Here's my presentation, which is open for comments. Um, I don't think the link to your presentation worked, James, but I'd be interested in seeing that. Lee has said, digital literacy is the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. Yes, that is a definition of digital literacy it's from the American Library Association, and there are many more like that, including ones from Microsoft, JISC, and various other places. Um, try Calibre to make a Kindle version of the PDF version. You're very welcome to do that. And Georgia says, hello. Excellent. 
If you're making general comments, you don't need to use the question and answer thing. If you're just as answering, uh, asking me questions, then use the question and answer. James, thank you for sharing that. That's wonderful. And I've cleared out the queue. Excellent. Thank you for your patience. Right, I'm going to screen share again. Here we go. I'm at slideshare.net forward slash DAJ Balshaw, and I'm going to move on um, from you remixing your memes. I'm just going to have a look on my Twitter feed to see if anybody has managed to do that yet. Tim has shared his contact selfie. Wonderful. Verena, I see you in there. And Sherry has got serious cat. You didn't see my post? Did you remember your hashtag? <laughs> So thank you very much, Sherry Edwards, for, for doing your meme. Oh, and Robin has got um, a Batman one. Batman, my definition of digital literacy is, shut up, Robin. There is no agreed upon definition. That is awesome. I'm going to use that in my next presentation. Oh, and she's done another one as well. Hey, Internet, why you know define digital literacy? Excellent. If you're not monitoring the DigiLit um, hashtag stream, then I, I suggest you might want to do that. It's awesome. Right, just a reminder, if you want to buy the book now, 20% um, off, it's um, just if you use the 20 off um, little code at gum.co forward slash digilit, you will take it down from 7.99 to five pounds something, because I failed A-level maths three times. Right, this is the bit, this is the important bit. This is chapter five of my book. So the eight elements of digital literacy. Let me quickly say where this came from. It must have been about 2008 or nine, and I was really stuck. I, there were all of these different definitions of digital literacy, and I didn't know what to do. Should I just choose one of them? Should I just do a critique of all of them? Like I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what the approach would be in terms of trying to come up with a definition of digital literacy. Should I try and come up with my own one? Should I add to the literature by adding yet another definition of digital literacy? And what I realized was, after reading this book from 1930 by a, a guy with an awesome beard called William Emson, and, and if you've never heard of William Emson, just ha have a look at the Wikipedia article, William Emson, um, E-M-P-S-O-N. Um, this guy lived in China. He was an um, English literary critic, and he wrote a book called Seven Types of Ambiguity. And it's one of those books you see in a remaindered bookstore, and you think, that looks really interesting, and you buy it, and you probably never actually read it. But in my case, I did actually read it, and it was fascinating. And I thought, this approach to ambiguity, this approach to things being not absolutely nailed down, is dynamite. This is wonderful. And it, it really is. It really has set off thinking not just in this sphere of digital literacy, but in almost every area of my life. Now, that might not be true of you, but it's certainly true of me. So what I ended up doing was looking at um, the world or the, the, the ecosystem of digital literacy through the lens um, of Emson. And what I ended up with were these eight elements of digital literacies. So if you zoom out from all these different definitions um, and you look at the successful ones, they almost all include these different elements. So um, we'll, we'll get to them in a moment, but there's, there's eight. Um, cultural, cognitive, constructive, communicative, confident, creative, critical, and civic. Um, and I've tried to give them cute kind of element names as if they're in the periodic table. I don't know how well that works, but never mind. So let's just go through them quickly. Um, we've got, um, and I'm just going to pull out some quotes from my research here, um, the cultural element. And again, you can define these however you want. These are just things which people talk about in the literature which are which they deem to be um, useful. So um, Hannah in 2000, a wonderful book, and all of these references are in my bibliography. Uh, my thesis is at um, neverendingthesis.com. Um, come. So I'll, I'll, I'll tweet that out actually. Um, Doug's thesis and the bibliography on there will have all of these things I'm about to talk about. So neverendingthesis.com hashtag digilit. Stefan, thank you very much for your contact selfie. That is awesome. There we go. So Hannon in 2000 talks about the nature of literacy in a culture is repeatedly redefined as the result of technological changes. You know, and we, we've seen that, you know, technology does help build and change um, communities and cultures and that kind of thing. It's not the only thing, but, um, you know, the, the nature of literacy is defined by technology because every type of literacy depends on some kind of technology, you know, be it a pen, a quill, a bit of paper, vellum, um, a computer, a mobile device, whatever it is, there's some kind of technology that literacy depends upon because at the end of the day, um, literacy is reading and writing, and I'm doing air quotes here, um, depending on what you what you mean by the term text. 
The second element, um, and I'm just going to race through these to be honest, and there's a bit more depth in my thesis. Um, the cognitive element, now this is what usually people focus upon. When they're talking about literacy, they usually focus upon the cognitive element. So Michael Gove was mentioned before, for those of you not in the UK, um, um, and well, he's the English Education Secretary. For those of you not um, lucky enough not to have to send your kids to schools run by um, the Education Secretary who's mad, um, Michael Gove is the UK, or the English Education Secretary, um, and he's very traditional. So he, he probably thinks about d digital literacy in this sense. So. Functional internet literacy is not the ability to use a set of technical tools, rather it is the ability to use a set of cognitive tools. So it's not procedural stuff, it's not like press this button here, go to this menu, do this thing, um, like a series of steps that somebody writes down. It's, it's the kind of the approach to it. It's if something changes, being able to keep up with it. Now, I've been told off before for using my grandma as an example. Um, apparently, it's ageist and sexist, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so, my grandmother is a prime example of this. If I ask, if I, if she needs to learn something new about something technological, like she gets a new phone, which she did recently, um, she has to sit down with whoever it is who's installing it for her, usually um, her son, my dad, or, or myself, and she has to write down all those different steps. She has Sky TV because she loves football and she never wants to miss a football match. So um, if Sky changed their menu system, <clears throat> she's stuck, you know, because it's changed. And previously she knew to press right three times, down once, then she knew where to go. If they change the menu system, then her procedural understanding of that has to completely change. She hasn't got the cognitive tools to understand the menu system behind that. And that's partly because she hasn't grown up with it and because she's not particularly interested in it and someone else can sort it out for her. But, you know, it's the cognitive idea behind the procedural stuff that happens there. That's the important thing. Okay, number three, constructive. So the quote here is from the Did You Lit project back in 2006, a very important study across Europe. Digital literacy is the awareness, attitude, and ability of individuals to appropriately use digital tools in order to enable constructive social action. So if you think about literacy always being about con constructing something, um, uh, that might be in terms of things like the solo taxonomy, in terms of constructing um, knowledge or constructing, um, like co-creating things, we'll be able to create it in a moment, but it has to be something to do with constructing so something. And usually when it comes with literacy, it's usually um, a gateway into knowledge and understanding. Um, and if you're interested in the solo taxonomy, um, just give it a quick search, or I do mention it in the book as well. Okay, communicative. Now, this is the, for me, the, the absolute basis of literacy. If, if you're, the whole point of literacy is to communicate with another person, and that other person could be you in the future. That's why people like me and other people write diaries. You know, you, you want to communicate with yourself in the future. Um, it might be communicating with, um, you know, you reading Seneca from centuries past. You know, that person might not have intentionally communicated with me, but, you know, they've had an intention of communicating with somebody, um, and that's, that's what's ended up with that literacy act. So the, the quotation I want to take out here is from David Buckingham, 2007. Um, digital literacy must therefore involve a systematic awareness of how digital media are constructed and of the unique rhetorics of interactive communication. So it's about reflecting on the fact of, of you as a communicator, using the literacy that you've learned to be able to communicate with somebody else. And so that can be in a digital sphere, like now, for example, Mike taking a screenshot of me and putting in the Twitter stream, um, or it could be, you know, um, in terms of writing things down. It's kind of the rhetorics of interactive communication. Okay, four more. So the confident element is one that I kind of hummed and hard about putting in, but I do think it's really important because it's, um, it, it is kind of, to my mind, central to digital literacy. It might not be central to normal literacy, but I think it is absolutely central to digital literacy. So the quotation here is from the OECD. Um, which I never remember the acronym for, but basically it's wealthy countries who depend on oil. Modern society is increasingly looking to people who can confidently solve problems and manage their own learning throughout their lives, the very qualities which ICT supremely is able to promote. Um, and so the example that I usually give here is the understanding that when you're in a digital environment, you can quite often press Control Z um, or Apple Z or whatever it is that you use on your device. Um, and this means you can undo stuff, which I'd love to be able to do in real life, or I shouldn't use the term real life, in offline, non-digital life. Um, I'd love to be able to undo some things last time. And sometimes when I've spent a long time on the screen, 
Um, I do mentally think about trying to undo stuff, but um, it doesn't work, unfortunately, when you're just falling off your bike or something. But being able to confidently interact with digital um, communications channels, confidently be able to interact with um, devices which are digital, I think is a really important part of, of learning and of literacy um, in the digital age. Three more. So um, the creative element of digital literacies. The creative adoption of new technology requires teachers who are willing to take risks, a prescriptive curriculum, routine practices, and, and tight target setting regime is unlikely to be helpful. Colin Simpson, 2003. So this is about approaching things in creative and new ways. So we had a wonderful example before by Mike, who I didn't pay to do this, but um, Mike gave the example of um, which led to the Samuel model. So being able to do things, not only which replicate things which happened before, but do things in, in ways which would previously have been unthinkable, absolutely transforming what it is to be human, I guess. Um, so some of Google's inventions, um, although to my mind, you know, they're sucking and harvesting my data, um, some of the things they've announced around watches and Google Glass and that kind of thing um, allow and augment the human experience. Um, and, you know, being able to adopt those in, in creative ways and taking risks and thinking, you know, what might happen in this, in this situation, um, you know, is, is part of digital literacy. Being able to have a go and seeing what happens, knowing that, you know, if you fail, you can fail softly because, you know, you're investigating new things. Um, next one, the critical element. So this is again from Conlon's and Sing Conlon and Simpson, 2003. Um, once we see that online texts are not exactly written or spoken, we begin to understand that cyber literacy, oh, an awful term, requires a special form of critical thinking. Communication in the online world is not quite like anything else. Now, in my thesis, which I don't want to refer to too much because it is a bit more academic than the book, and the whole point is um, for you to have a look at this book, um, in, the, in my thesis I do talk about the work of Walter Ong, who talks about the idea of um, a secondary orality. So we've had this, what is often termed the Gutenberg parenthesis between the, the printing press um, and now, so before the printing press, most people, you know, were not literate in a textual sense. They, you know, things were handed down orally. You know, people learned things by rote, etc. Um, and then we've had this Gutenberg parenthesis, which people talk about um, being between the printing press um, and the invention of the internet. Um, and that now we're ending up with this kind of secondary orality through um, rich digital media, through video, through audio, through the kinds of things that we're doing now, which is kind of predicated upon text, but not entirely text-based. So um, being able to reflect on that, thinking about the, the best means of communication, the ways in which you can um, adapt those rhetorics for, of communication for different contexts, those kinds of things are the way in which you reflect on um, your own literacy practices. Um, and, and at the end of the day, if you can reflect on your own literacy practices, then to my mind, you're literate. And the last one is civic. Um, so again, this is Conlon and Simpson. I've quoted them many times because they're definitely worth quoting. If you want to have a look at their work, have a look at the bibliography um, of my thesis. The ability to understand and make use of ICT, digital literacy, is proving essential to employment success, civic participation, accessing entertainment and education. Um, and in the book, um, I give the example of, oh, I don't know, the, the Arab Spring, Occupy, that kind of thing, thinking about not just digital literacy for its own sake, but actually trying to um, have some kind of social action, trying to make the world better because of the new skills that you've got. Um, and I, I feel it's worth throwing that element in there as well. Okay. Um, and then the final thing to say, and this is something which I say a lot, is a wonderful quotation from Alan Martin, 2006, who says that um, digital literacy is a condition, not a threshold. And this is worth hanging on to. This is worth, you know, screenshotting. This is worth, um, you know, writing down on many, many things. Because any time that somebody tries to tell you, I know, let's have a test for digital literacy. This is the quotation and this is the reference that you need to bring out. Because digital literacy is not about getting to a certain threshold above which you now say, oh, I'm now digitally literate. It's about an ongoing condition. It's about a change in the, in the very fabric of who you are to have a different attitude and a different lens on the world. Um, and that is very difficult to, to quantify. It's much more of a, um, a qualitative difference. All right, before I talk about working with others and not re reinventing the wheel, I am going to go back into the um, question stream just to see if there are any. The Twitter stream seems to be moving quite quickly, so um, I might not be able to keep up with all. Here we go. Um, Mike's talking about um, 
couldn't have had a video call to West Coast USA in analog times. Will the phone count? Not really. No, exactly. I mean, I work in different time zones every single day in my job. Lee has um, shared something which he's created in memegenerate.net. Thank you very much. I'll have a look at that in a moment. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Lee has said, yes, use of tags to organize information is important. Moving literacy from the two dimension to the multi-dimensional for me. Um, for example, Google Map with markers and media to accompany non-fiction travel. Excellent. Um, Tony, OECD is the organization for economic cooperation and development. Yes, the oil producing company, uh, oil dependent countries. Stimulate oil trade. Um, James has opened a can of worms by saying, so is the current school primary direction to coding at the expense of broader digital literacy building, digital literacy building a mistake? Mm. I've written about this. Um, so I often write at my own blog, but I, I sometimes write at a, at a blog called DML Central. So DML, if you don't follow their work, um, it's uh, the Digital Media and Learning um, Program as part of MacArthur in the US. So dmlcentral.net, I, I did write something, which I'll try and dig out the link for in a moment. If someone else can beat me to it, that'd be awesome. But at the start of the year, I wrote about how important it is to, to focus on a much more holistic kind of web literacy or digital literacy, um, or digital literacies, than it is to, to focus just on coding. Because to my mind, coding is just one subset of this, this wider approach to kind of a, the digital sphere and, and the web. That particular article, I was thinking of from like my work point of view, so web literacy, but it's a really important point. Yes, I think that coding is important, but it's much more important from an um, understanding algorithms point of view than it is from a press this button and this thing pops up point of view. So it's much more of an approach to the world. Yeah. Oh, Miles has opened another can of worms. Doug, how do you feel about Sigata Mitra's views on future learning? Um, have a look at Donald Clark's um, blog posts about um, Sigata Mitra and his hole in the wall stuff and things like that. I, I like what he's trying to do. Um, I'm just not entirely sure that um, the reason why his stuff's got so popular is because of the research base. I seem to think it's because there's a lot of money to be made in education if you think there's a solution to it. Um, and I think that, that he's been bankrolled by quite a lot of people. But hey. Um, from the perspective of a language teacher, online text, this is Jerome. From the perspective of a language teacher, online texts need additional skills and strategies. And some students have to learn to comprehend online text. Schools have to work this into the curriculum. Where does this fit into your eight elements? Excellent. Let's go back into the eight elements there. So what you're saying is that um, basically the digital world is not like the um, offline world. And so you have to kind of think about how to read a text differently. All right. So I've already said, Jerome, that, and this is one of the questions you asked me beforehand, which is why I'm going to deal with it in a bit more um, detail than the questions now, because I can skip that at the end. So when it comes to the eight elements of digital literacy, now if this is wrong, awesome. Like let's change it. Let's, let's make things different. I'm not trying to build a career upon eight elements of digital literacies. I have other things that I do. But what I'm saying is this might be a useful approach in your particular context. So let's say that you've got some students who need to understand that this stuff which is written on paper is different from hypertext environments. Then I would suggest that if you look at this, first of all, you'll look at the culture of the web. Like, what does it mean to be literate in the community, um, in, like in a Twitter community? What does it mean to be literate in terms of um, just the wider kind of web community? So the fact that you can add comments to things like blogs and YouTube, what does it mean to be literate in terms of backwards and forwards and communication in that sense? In terms of, um, and I think probably the main thing in terms of the different rhetorics of communication, different rhetorics of literacy in the context that you're talking about, I would suggest that the confident element is the difference here. Because if you, um, for example, have a bit of paper that you've written on, and you've written something really stupid that you, is regrettable, and you can take that and you can burn it in a fire. You can shred it. As soon as you put that on the web and it's been there for more than about five seconds, then someone's going to be able to find some kind of cached copy. They can find a copy of it somewhere and they can bring it up and they can haunt you. So this used to be um, a staple of e-safety presentations, you know, like be careful what you put online, children, because it will come back to haunt you when you want a job. Um, but I think those kinds of things... I think they're kind of tangential across, and you're right, it's a cross-cutting theme. But I think if you think about your context and you think about how those things fit in, it may or may not work. And it might be something which isn't really like um, 
a digital literacies kind of thing. It might be more on the information literacies side of thing. And I'm not saying that this is one framework to rule them all. That's what I'm trying to avoid. I'm trying to say this is an approach to what it is that you're trying to do when you're trying to make people more confident and, um, and kind of more comfortable in online spaces. I hope that answers your question. Mike says, what's your view on the digital divide, um, if you think there is one, especially the control commands, con control command and F, so being able to find things, suggesting 90.5% of people have no clue what it does, including over half of teachers. So um, for those who aren't aware, if you press um, command F or control F on your keyboard, it will find, it'll let you be able to search and find things within um, whatever web page you're on. Um, and so uh, Mike's saying that the digital divide um, you know, might be in terms of people not understanding those kinds of things. I usually understand or conceptualize a digital divide as being access to that technology. So um, I, I, was, I grew up in an area, a quite a deprived area, which was an ex-mining area. So basically, shut the pits, no employment, um, you know, uh, quite a lot of um, unemployment and, and drugs and that kind of thing. Um, and, and the problem there is that you've got a catch-22 situation, as happens all over the world. So you've got a situation where, where I live now, I have super fast broadband because people are willing to pay for it because people like me work from home or you know they have spare cash to be able to spend on this kind of thing. In poorer areas where they don't have that, then there's no demand for the faster broadband, for example, um, or can't afford the computers or, or do whatever. So you end up with um, a widening gap so not only kind of a literacy gap, but then a digital literacy gap, and then an access to resources gap. Um, and the, the, the unfortunate thing there is that any kind of solution that you try and put in is usually um, um, opposed by people who have an interest in the status quo. Um, let me just give you a quick example of that. Um, I was director of e-learning in an academy. We wanted to put in a big mast to give, um, to give basically free wireless access to everybody in the area but that wasn't allowed because of anti-competition laws. So there's always people who have a, a vested interest in the status quo, and that's why the digital divide persists, I'd say. Miles, thank you very much for sharing um, that um, DML article. I think it was titled, Going Beyond Learning to Code While 2014 is the Year of Web Literacy. Thanks, Miles. Um, James is saying children on their own tend to descend to Lord of the Flies. I agree, I have children. Um, Lee has shared another picture of what he's been up to. Thank you very much. Jerome is asking for me to go further. I would like if we could add more about online literacy and online reading comprehension because this is a real concern of teachers. I start working with teachers and also with a publisher on that. Jerome, I would suggest that um, your particular interest here, and, and I'd be willing to debate and discuss this further, um, is more on the information literacy side of things than specifically on digital literacies, as far as I understand it anyway. But I'd, I'd be interested to talk about more about that. We've got four minutes left. James um, says, you have been consistent as an advocate for building digital literacies, and I found that advocacy really important. For me, students' love of coding builds as they become confident users of digital tools, not by focusing on coding to start with. Amen to that, James. I'm going to finish off because we've got three four minutes left, and I value people's time, and it's also the next match in the World Cup, which I very much want to watch. So here we are, scoop through this. Here we go, right. Oh, too far, there we go. I cannot suggest enough, right, if you are ever tasked by anybody to do something by yourself, always find out what happened before and communicate with those people. Don't sit with a cold towel on your head in a darkened room trying to think hard about stuff. Work with other people, either people who are working on the same problem or have done that before. Please do not reinvent the wheel. Um, so if you are coming up with, you know, new things around if you find this book useful, if you find this approach useful, you might not, you might find it useless, I don't know. But if you find it useful, then you know, please do share what you're doing, either on your own blog or put it on this wiki. You know, It tells you on there how to get started, how to create an account, how to fill out your profile page, all that kind of stuff. This is your wiki, this is not mine. You can do with it what you wish as long as you don't spam me. Um, so do use that. Do get in touch with me, do debate this stuff. Um, if you do email me, I will ask you to debate this in, in public so that I can reference this as a hyperlink rather than by email. Um, so do you know? Do work with other people and do think about the context and within which you're working. Um, it's often really futile to have debates about definitions. It's much more productive to think about, you know, well, perhaps that person's context is different to mine. Um, I often talk about this African proverb. It's one I really like, alongside that Alan Martin quote. Um, again, it's one to share. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, 
go together. Um, now, this is true in almost every area of life, and it's particularly true when you're trying to come up with some kind of effectively change management, which is what you're doing if you're in an institution and you want to focus on digital literacies. If you want to go fast, go alone. You know, go with a single department. Go by yourself. Come up with a thing by yourself. But if you want like substantial difference to happen in your institution or your organisation or your children or whatever it is, like you need to work together with people. You need to, and that's messy and hard. And people disagree. And people storm off in the huff. Um, and people, you know. Um, or weird sometimes. But if you don't do that, if you don't get over those hurdles and if you don't go through things together, you're not going to go very far. You're going to go very fast, but it might be down the wrong path and down the wrong road, and you're going to end up with the problems all over again. So don't reinvent the wheel. Work with other people. Ask them what they think. Um, and don't assume that their negativity towards what you're doing is couched in you being wrong or them being stupid. It's just a difference in context and a different approach. Um, and you might not need to just tell them they're wrong, you might need to try and understand the context. Okay, so I've got some questions. Um, I've got one minute left. I'm not going to be able to answer all of these. Um, and if you've got some questions, um, I'd love to answer them. I will stay on Twitter and on Google Plus while I'm watching football in a moment. Let me answer these really question, really quickly. Simon was kind enough to answer me the first, asked me the first question. How do you differentiate and prioritize the learning of different, different digital literacies for different publics? Well, um, that goes to what I was talking about before in terms of context. Uh, first of all, you need to define what you mean by different publics. Um, and then when you take the different elements of digital literacies, you can potentially prioritize those. So you can say that what we're trying to do here in terms of this context is we're trying to um, engage people in civic participation. So we're going to really prioritize that element of digital literacies. So one thing you could do is a conversation starter with people, some kind of um, workshop activity. Um, I'm happy to run workshops for people, but if you if you want to run your own using my resources, anyone else's resources, you might want to start off with, here's some elements of digital literacies. Why don't you put them in order? Because talking about the order of them gets that conversation started. So that's the way I'd start doing that. George, how do you start the conversation with folks immersed in 1990s information literacy that does not fully engage with evolving technology? Well, telling them to get with the program doesn't usually work. Um, usually saying, oh, that's interesting because that's information literacy. I've got another approach. This is a different lens on the situation. Talking about lenses tends to engage people because they realize that actually what you're trying to do is just have a different view on a similar thing that they find already comforting and they, they have knowledge of. So instead of saying, hey, that's throughout information literacy. We're now dealing with the digital literacy kids. You know, it doesn't usually work. You need to have a, a different kind of approach to that. Um, and then George asked a follow-up question, which was, how do you start the conversation with folks who see literacy as reading and writing only and see the rest as skills that aren't really literacies? Um, interesting. I would ask them to, to ask, I'd ask them what reading and what you're doing when you're reading and writing and talk about text, um, and then try and, almost like the Socratic method, say, well, OK, does that text, is that still a text when you put it on the internet? Is that still a text when you add a hyperlink to it? Is that still a text when you add a YouTube video to it? And then start to build up that idea of what a text can be, and basically you're introducing them to postmodernism and Derrida and all that kind of stuff. And so you're, you're making the text metaphorical, and as soon as they understand that the text is metaphorical, then reading and writing become metaphorical as well. And you're reading and writing text, I'm using air quotes here, so that they can understand that um, multimedia things are also text as well. Jerome, I think I've already kind of answered your question. If I haven't, then I'd be happy to follow up with you, um, perhaps as a debate in a follow-up follow hangout. I did a TEDx talk a couple of years ago. Um, it basically focused on my thesis. I have got some stuff in the book, which is since then, but that's 18 minutes of your life, or 70 minutes of your life, which um, you won't get back if you watch that. Um, and again, if you want to buy the book, 20% off, use the code 20off um, at gum.co forward slash digilit. Um, that's the end of that. Um, that's pretty much, I've gone two minutes over. I do apologize for those of you who want to watch the football. I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to stay on Twitter. I'm going to stay on Google+. You can email me. I'm mail at dougbellshaw.com, D-A-J Bellshaw on Twitter, and plus Doug Bellshaw on Google+. Um, and if you haven't had a look at the wiki, have a look through. Some people have done some nice reviews. Very kind. I can't see any more questions on there. Thanks all. I'm going to turn this off now.